Now, I know you're all asking yourself the question why a pediatric hepatologist is speaking at a cardiac conference. Um, and it took me a minute to figure that out as well. Worse yet, I'm talking about drug-induced liver disease. Um, and as you think about it, I know you're also thinking, well, as hepatologists frequently tell you, and you always agree, um, in the situation of congenital heart disease, any liver disease is, of course, due to the heart. Um, and, and whereas that is almost always the case, um, there are some occasions when it is not the case. And really, my job is to try to convince you that um, as we all use multiple medications in our patients, especially those with chronic liver disease, uh, we do have to have a high index of suspicion for drug-induced liver injury um, when the liver labs are uh, elevated. And this is especially true in anyone who is at risk for some underlying liver disease. So what I'll try to do over the next uh, 15 minutes is share with you um, and impress upon you the significance of this problem and why we do have to have a high index of suspicion. I'll go through very briefly, um, as time will allow, mechanisms uh, influencing host factors, clinical patterns that one might experience, and then um, as examples of different patterns of uh, injury, specific medications, some of which are cardiac in nature. So let's talk about the significance of drug-induced liver disease. Well, we do know that approximately 14 to 19 out of, out of 100,000 adult patient years do suffer drug-induced liver injury, and, and, and this is the most common cause for withdrawal of drugs from the market. If we consider those individuals who suffer acute liver failure in the adult population, approximately 50% of them are due to a drug-induced cause. This is a little bit lower in children, where we do know, especially in toddlers, about 50% remain idiopathic. It's probably metabolic or infectious. But that said, approximately 20% of pediatric acute liver failure is due to medication. Fortunately, unlike adults, the fatality or need for transplantation in pediatrics is reasonably low at approximately 5%. However, we also know that not all drugs are created equally as relates to impact on the liver. So this was a study that was I was involved with some years ago uh, conducted by the Pediatric Acute Liver Failure Study Group, which was an NIH, con NIH consortium put together for the study of, liver of acute liver failure. And Although the causes of acute liver failure in the consortium were very broad, we did do a sub-analysis to look at the drug-induced episodes of liver failure. And we studied the first 348 such patients. And we could see that there was a very marked difference in the outcomes of children with drug-induced liver injury in if it was acetaminophen-induced, paracetamol if one is in, in Europe, uh, versus other medications. And the other medications were relatively infrequent and therefore grouped together, but you can see the outcomes are quite striking. Uh, unlike in adults, in acetaminophen toxicity, most children survive without the need of transplantation. That was approximately 94%. However, if you look at all other drugs put together, and there was obviously some variation, but approximately uh, just over a third actually survived without transplant, with approximately a third each either uh, succumbing to the injury or uh, only surviving with transplantation. To further underscore the distribution of medications that impact liver disease and acute liver failure, the uh, drug-induced liver injury network studied pediatric patients, there were 57 in total, to look at the drugs that were uh, mainly to cause. And as, is, as you can see listed in the PALF study as well, the vast majority, approximately 51%, were antimicrobials or um, other anti-infectious agents, and, uh, and uh, the next highest percentage were the antileptic medications. The list above, there are some darker medications. I'm just going to allude to these as we walk through some examples. So how do these medications cause hepatotoxicity? And it depends entirely on the drug and the circumstance. However, uh, direct hepatotoxicity is certainly a very common cause, and acetaminophen would be an example of this, where a toxic metabolite causes covalence of proteins and hepatocellular injury. However, there are also examples of immune-mediated injury, and uh, hydralazine is actually an example of that, though it is uncommon, and minocycline is by far the most common example of an autoimmune-type mediated 
injury. Mitochondrial injury is also very common. Valproic acid would be an example uh, that is more common, obviously, in anti-epileptic. And amiodarone uh, does inflict liver injury through a mitochondrial injury mechanism. And then there are some that are more idiosyncratic in nature. Just because a drug may, of course, fall and have the propensity to cause one of these hepatotoxicities, of course, does not mean that it will necessarily, and there are a myriad of factors, many of them host uh, or other toxins that may mediate this risk. Genetic, as well as medications that may influence the cytochrome P P450 system, which is involved in many of the drug metabolism uh, pathways. Age of children, aside from weight itself, obviously can affect uh, metabolism as pediatricians, we all know that. And then there are concomitant toxins and underlying liver conditions. Concomitant toxins, by far the most common, especially in adults, are alcohol and um, other viral illnesses, whether they be acute or chronic. And then any other liver conditions, whether it be infectious or other chronic conditions, and the setting of chronic heart disease with right-sided high pressures um, are, would certainly fall into this category. The patterns that one might see if you look at both laboratory as well as histologic patterns do vary and are somewhat stereotypical to the different kinds of drugs. So I already mentioned acetaminophen, which uh, can cause acute liver failure and direct hepatocellular necrosis, and, I, and I'll uh, speak a little bit more about that in a minute. It also causes an elevation of transaminases and a pure hepatitis. Cholestasis can be seen, and, and a classic example is amoxicillin clavulonic acid, also known as um, augmentin. And it, too, in a more chronic state, can cause vanishing bile duct syndrome, which is listed below. And then there are mixed patterns where you have a hepatitis as well as a cholestasis. And hydralazine might be an example of this. Um, and, and the statins, though very safe um, when they do occur, uh, cause a mixed pattern. And then when one gets chronic uh, inflammation or injury, it can be in the form of a hepatitis with elevation of AST and AIDS, ALT with predominant target, the hepatocytes. Uh, versus the cholangiocytes, which can lead to vanishing bile duct syndrome, uh, steatosis and steatohepatitis, which is classic of the mitochondrial uh, mechanisms, methotrexate and amiodarone would be an example. And then uh, there are some drugs that can cause a sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. So let's go through a couple of medications in very brief, and I will uh, highlight some of the, the very few cardiac drugs that actually are, are known to do this. So here's acetaminophen. Um, I, I highlight acetaminophen because it is used very commonly by, um, by everybody, and certainly hospitals are no exception. It's also available in IV form, and I, and I think it's used to a point um, that we really do have to remind ourselves that it is not without toxicity. So in brief, you'll be reminded that acetaminophen is metabolized through phase one metabolism using the P450 system, and then glutathione transferase uh, detoxifies from NAP, which is uh, NSLP uh, benzoquinone amine, which is a very highly reactive uh, intermediate toxic metabolite, usually produced in very low quantities and easily detoxified. However, if in a setting of large burden of acetaminophen or in a setting where there are other stressors in the liver such that glutathione mechanism is depleted, you will have NAPQI uh, um, uh, increased burden, and that can cause hepatocyte damage by direct covalence to proteins, which causes direct hepatocellular injury. This is, of course, dose-dependent. Uh, other toxins, concomitant drugs, alcohol, and underlying hepatic conditions can increase the likely risk of this. And once it is recognized, one needs to institute therapy, which is providing back a mechanism for glutathione replenishment in, in uh, an acetylcysteine. The prognosis is very good, especially when identified early, with most children recovering uh, is not nearly as good in the adult population, and only about 5% will go on to transplantation. One of the patterns that is very typical and stereotypical of acetaminophen toxicity is an elevation of the prothrombin time, which is out of proportion to the other evidence of injury and hepatocellular elevation and, and um, Billy. Um, uh, direct bilirubin elevation and a lack of acidosis. And when that is seen, um, I would ask myself the question as to whether acetaminophen could be playing a role. 
Uh, on the right is a panel of the normal uh, liver histology for those of you who may not be used to looking at that. And on the left, larger panel is an example of hepatocellular uh, direct injury, necrosis, and collapse secondary to acetaminophen. So amoxicillin clavulonic acid, again, a very common antibiotic on the market that is used by um, in, in a myriad of situations, and it is known for its creation of cholestasis and the potential for vanishing bile duct syndrome uh, chronically. So uh, it has a higher likelihood, though it is still rare, 1.7 by um, over uh, 10,000 prescriptions, more so than amoxicillin and more so than the semi-synthetic penicillins. It tends to create a delayed cholestatic or sometimes mixed pattern. And in the image there to the right, you can see the little brown dots are cholestasis with biliary uh, proliferation. This is um, commonly associated with rash, fever, arthralgias, eosinophilia, suggestive of an underlying immune-mediated mechanism. You also can get inflammation of the lacrimal glands, uh, the kidneys, and the salivary system. The onset tends to be uh, somewhat delayed, so days to months, and that is typically onset after the prescription is stopped, as we usually use uh, amoxicillin clavulonic acid for short courses of therapy. The jaundice may, re may resolve within two uh, months. However, the biochemical resolution is a bit delayed thereafter at four months. And deaths are typically from vanishing bile duct syndrome um, or require for liver transplantation. Methotrexate. Uh, used in some transplant settings. As you know, based on its uh, molecular structural structure, it inhibits folic acid metabolism. It competes for cellular uptake. When it does so, it inhibits the tetrahydrofolate reductase and therefore impairs DNA synthesis by uh, interfering with the synthesis of pyrimidines and purines. Early and still reversible, you do get some my, uh, mitochondrial injury, bile duct damage, and then stellate say, cell hyperplasia, which will contribute to fibrosis that methotrexate is known for. Here you can see a macrovesicular steatosis secondary to the mitochondrial injury. You get a zone three hepatocyte degeneration, nuclear pleomorphism, and subsequently and later this chicken wire pattern of fibrosis. So let's talk about just a few cardiac drugs, um, including hydralazine, which uh, is rarely significantly hepatotoxic, um, but when it is, it does through through an immune mediated mechanism. There are two patterns. One is more um, proximal with an onset at two to six weeks after usage, whereas the the other pattern is more delayed at two months to a year. It's a lupus-like reaction with hypersensitivity. You may get other autoimmune feature, features and frequently have fever, rash, and eosinophilia. Uh, the hepatic pattern, it can be that of a hepatocellular or a hepatitis pattern. So this is a graph of liver values. You can see elevation of ALT and AST with the graph on the left starting approximately two months after uh, commencement of this medication. Or you can get a mixed pattern or purely cholestatic. So the, the uh, data on the right is that of direct bilirubin. Your GGT would, would follow a similar pattern reflective of cholangiocyte damage, and you may get a pattern of both. Typically, this injury does resolve after discontinuation of the medication. Amiodarone, a medication that I'm sure Dr. Aziz um, is very fond of, um, does rarely, and approximately 1% of uh, individuals cause apparent liver disease, but uh, does result in transaminase, transaminase elevation as many as 50%. The, uh, the injury is really reminiscent of an occult steatohepatitis through a mitochondrial injury mechanism, and you can see in both of these panels ballooning degeneration of hepatocytes, and the panel on the left shows uh, sinusoidal fibrosis that is really typical after you get ballooning steatohepatitis collapse and, and uh, promotion of stellate uh, activation. Just going to make one comment about the statins, as statins historically had gotten uh, bad press. However, the uh, American College of Cardiology did come out with a reassuring statement at the end of 2018 that does not recommend routine monitoring for transaminase levels. Only approximately 1% of individuals have an asymptomatic 
elevation of transaminases or uh, statins, and the um, clinically significant hepatocyte toxicity is actually quite rare. There was a study recently in pediatrics, a total of 943 patients, and approximately 208 of them were analyzed in a sub-analysis who were on statins. These were about half of them were obese, 50% of them were boys. This was uh, typically a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, hepatitis, and the follow-up was approximately 18 months. And the good news is that those individuals who were on statins actually had lower ALT than those who were not. And during the duration of the 18 months, those on um, statins did not have an increase in their ALT. So to summarize, um, I would say that in your field of cardiology, the, um, the drugs are usually very mild and the recovery when it does occur um, is usually very good. We do need to worry about acute liver failure and especially in the setting of underlying liver disease, we need to have a high index of suspicion for drug-induced uh, liver disease for us to really um, assure ourselves that this it may be playing a role in the toxicity. And with that, I will end. Thank you.